When training to put on muscle mass, there are a few principles that help you understand why training a certain way produces the results it does. In this video, which is the first of a three-part video series, we'll go through one underrated and less known principle, neuromechanical matching, which has implications for what exercises you may want to select in a regimen designed for developing muscle mass. To grasp neuromechanical matching, it's first worth understanding its cousin, Henneman's size principle. There's a good chance you're aware of Henneman's size principle, at least in its simplest form. Namely, as you use progressively heavier and heavier weights, or as you fatigue while performing repetitions with a light weight, more and more muscle fibers get recruited. It's worth diving into this principle more, as not only is it highly fascinating, but it somewhat relates to neuromechanical matching. Henneman's size principle says motor units are recruited in sequential order. A motor unit refers to a single motor neuron that branches out and supplies electrical signals to a bundle of multiple muscle fibers. When the single motor neuron sends electrical signals to the multiple muscle fibers it supplies, the fibers produce force. Different types of motor units exist, and their characteristics can be described across a spectrum. On one end of the spectrum are slow motor units, also called low threshold motor units, that consist of a small motor neuron that supplies a bundle of slow twitch muscle fibers. Slow twitch muscle fibers produce low forces but are very fatigue resistant. On the other end of the spectrum are fast motor units, also called high threshold motor units, that consist of a large motor neuron that supplies a bundle of fast twitch muscle fibers. Fast twitch muscle fibers produce high forces but fatigue quickly. When producing low muscle forces, only slow motor units are primarily recruited. For example, when walking at a slow pace, the slow motor units within your various lower body muscles are primarily recruited. But, as a muscle progressively needs to generate higher and higher forces, or it fatigues while trying to sustain a given force output, those higher threshold motor units get recruited. This is Henneman's size principle, the concept that motor units are recruited in a sequential order depending on the demands imposed on a muscle. It's called Henneman's size principle as it was Eelwood Henneman who first discovered all this during his pioneering research in the 1960s. This principle is one reason behind something we consistently see in the literature, that a wide range of loads, as light as 30% or 1 rep max and as heavy as 80% or 1 rep max, produce similar muscle growth provided reps are performed to or close to failure. Heavier loads, like an 80% or 1 rep max load, will readily recruit many motor units, from the slow to fast motor units, as the muscle readily needs to generate high forces. Moreover, as you near failure with this load, further fast motor units are recruited. Light loads, like a 30% or 1 rep max load, predominantly only require slow motor unit recruitment initially, as the muscle only needs to produce low forces, but as you continue performing repetitions and get closer and closer to failure, those fast motor units get recruited. Ultimately, overall motor unit recruitment ends up being similar to what's achieved with heavier loads, thus meaning you stimulate a similar number of muscle fibers, partly explaining the similar muscle growth observed between light and heavy loads. Now we understand Henneman's size principle, how does neuromechanical matching fit into the picture? Imagine you've performed the back squat with repetitions to failure with a 30% or 1 rep max load. Based on Henneman's size principle alone, you would think you've more or less stimulated all the slow and fast motor units throughout the whole of the quadriceps. However, this is probably not true. There's evidence within muscles subgroups of motor units exist. These subgroups of motor units do not have identical functions. For instance, with the biceps, though it's not crystal clear currently, some evidence suggests three subpopulation of motor units could exist. The first motor unit subgroup is only recruited during flexion of the elbow and nothing else. The second motor unit subgroup is only recruited during supination of the forearm and nothing else. The third motor unit subgroup is only recruited during both elbow flexion and supination of the forearm. Within each of these subgroups of motor units, Henneman's size principle likely applies. 
For instance, if you perform some sort of forearm supination exercise to failure, the subgroup of motor units within the biceps that carry out supination only will be recruited in sequential order. That is, if you are using a light load, the slow motor units of that subgroup will be recruited first, and then as you near failure, the fast motor units part of that subgroup will be further recruited. Direct and indirect evidence for the existence of subgroups of motor units exist for other muscles like the triceps, calves, quadriceps, hamstrings, and other smaller muscles belonging to the hand and forearm. What is the purpose of these motor unit subgroups? Neuromechanical matching may be the answer. Numerous muscle fibers exist within a muscle. As a fun fact, some researchers have estimated the biceps brachii of humans contains anywhere from 198,000 to 419,000 muscle fibers. During any given movement that recruits a muscle, all the muscle fibers within that muscle don't have identical mechanical advantage. Numerous intricate factors go behind determining the mechanical advantage of muscle fibers during a movement, but you can simply think of mechanical advantage as how easily a muscle fiber can produce force for a given movement. As an example, during elbow flexion, some muscle fibers in the biceps are going to be positioned to more efficiently produce elbow flexion forces, while other muscle fibers in the biceps are positioned in a way that means they're less efficient at producing elbow flexion forces. This probably explains why subgroups of motor units exist within a muscle. The different subgroups contain muscle fibers that have different mechanical advantages for different movements. Returning to the three potential motor unit subgroups in the biceps, the subgroup of motor units involved in elbow flexion only would presumably contain muscle fibers that are positioned to be mechanically advantageous for elbow flexion only. The subgroup of motor units involved in supination only would presumably contain muscle fibers that are positioned to be mechanically advantageous for supination only. The subgroup of motor units involved in simultaneous supination and elbow flexion would presumably contain muscle fibers that are positioned to be mechanically advantageous for both these motions. This is neuromechanical matching, where the nervous system matches the recruitment of mechanically advantageous muscle fibers to a specific movement. In the literature, there's now good evidence for regional hypertrophy. This is where a muscle does not grow evenly across its regions. For example, Kawakami and colleagues found after subjects trained overhead extensions for 16 weeks, the triceps mainly increased in cross-sectional area in the middle to slightly upper regions, but in the most upper and lower regions of the muscle, little growth was experienced. Likewise, Emma and colleagues found after leg extension training for 12 weeks, growth not only differed between the quadriceps heads, but within each of these muscle heads, growth differed between the upper and lower regions of them. Neuromechanical matching is a strong candidate to explain regional hypertrophy. The regions of a muscle that grow the most in response to a single exercise probably contain muscle fibers that are positioned to be more mechanically advantageous during the execution of that exercise. The implication of neuromechanical matching is one exercise for a muscle or muscle group is likely not going to maximize its overall growth. You're probably going to want to select a couple of different exercises per muscle that biomechanically differ. This should increase the probability you effectively simulate more, if not all, the motor unit subgroups within a muscle, thus leading to greater growth across more regions of a muscle. As some examples, Training the biceps and triceps at a variety of shoulder angles is probably a good idea. Training the hamstrings with not only hip extension motions but also a knee flexion motion is likely a good idea. For the back, having vertical and horizontal pulling variations is likely a good idea. For the quadriceps, including a couple of different knee extension exercises is likely a good idea. <laughs> 